great pleasure to have you all with us today. Today's session of the Gerhard Center webinar series, the aftermath of the COVID-19, the, so the new social impact ecosystem. The series was launched back in April with the aim of discussing concepts that are currently mainstream, not mainstream. And may today is the 19th session, and it's a pleasure to have with us Robert Key, the chairman and founder of Operation Hope Foundation, a foundation operating mainly in Nepal and Cambodia. The title of the talk is The Virus of, po uh, the virus of Poverty is Fraud. Sadly, for work done by NGOs, fraud led to beneficiaries receiving small percentages of what has been donated. NGOs depend on auditor to provide the aura of accountability, but all the, all auditors rely on receipts which are often falsified. Uh, the Oper Operation Hope Foundation ha was developed, has developed over the 20, 20 years a system to detect, prevent fraud without relying on receipts. Some of the concepts as to how fraud can be stopped will be shared in this talk. Stopping fraud is the key to ensure that donations and aid will alleviate poverty and give hope to those for whom the donations were intended. Uh, let me introduce Robert. Robert is a founded Operation Hope Foundation as an international NGO. It's based on Singapore. It's operating in Cambodia and Nepal since 2002. They run programs in four areas, community, skills training, volunteer, and children. He won a scholarship back to, to study electrical engineering in University of Auckland, New Zealand. He has a master's of engineering uh, degree from the National University of Singapore. He's a ser serial entrepreneur. He has three companies in manufacturing, properties, and a hotel. He has worked full-time with no salary to OHF since 2002. Uh, I've met Robert back in, uh, in Singapore in, three years ago. It was a conference of a BOP, a base of the Pyramid Lab Network, which we are members of. And I, I was sort of hanging around on the table of OHF and I was intrigued with what they're doing. I started discussing. And then the lady on the, on the, on the, on the manning the booth, the booth suggested that, hey, Robert is coming tomorrow. Why don't you talk to him? He's gonna give you more details. And when we started this seminar series, the webinar series, the one, one of the pe first people I thought about was Robert because he really has a hands-on exp expertise He's not talking from, from an office or from a textbook. He's talking from a field earned experience. The plan of the webinar, as usual, oh, Robert is going to talk for 30 minutes, give or take. We're going to have afterwards a Q&A. If you have questions or whatever, just comment questions, send it uh, on your uh, chat box to one of the, the, uh, the co-hosts. And then in the end, we'll wrap up and we'll try to sort of make it at the hour as usual. Without much ado, Robert, thank you for being with us. The floor is yours, sir. Okay, okay thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, <clears throat> this is something I'm, I'm very passionate about. Uh, I started way back in 1995, uh, trying to help the poor. And we, I've traveled all over Asia, in Vietnam, Laos, Indonesia, Philippines, Cambodia. And finally, I ended up in uh, Cambodia and Nepal. I started as a philanthropist, trying to give away money. And then I found that giving away money was very, very difficult. <laughs> I mean, if you want to make sure that your money is well used. Okay, I will now uh, start my presentation. Okay, I will share the screen. So, yes, so the title is The Virus of Poverty is Fraud because I realized that, you know, poverty, fraud is really like a virus. And when it's spread throughout the country, affecting government and businesses, is, it is very hard for the country to progress economically, you know? Okay, so uh, let me see. Uh, okay, uh, this is a quote from Joe Biden. He said, corruption is a cancer, a cancer that eats away at a citizen's faith in democracy. So like cancer, I see that uh, corruption always remains hidden and it spreads until it kills the economy. And when you have the death of an economy, it's very sad because there's a death of free enterprise, there's a death of innovation, and there's a death of jobs. And I can see that, for example, in Nepal, millions of people, millions of Nepali 
are migrant workers in the Middle East, in Europe, and in Asia. I think in the uh, Arab countries, there, there are a lot of them, you know. And the same with Cambodia, many of them are migrant workers in Thailand and Vietnam, and now they're even going to Korea. I think it's really, really sad if a, when a country is unable to provide jobs for their own citizen, and they have to leave their family to go and work outside. And even the women, they have to leave their children behind, which I think is a very sad thing. All right. So where does corruption exist? Well, at the government level, uh, we know there's corruption, but that is not an area that I am familiar with, so I will not talk about it. I only like to talk about things in which I have hands-on experience. The second area is business, and corruption will affect business. So I can see that many businesses remain small, especially when the business are relying on cash. So you find that the business owner will only rely on their relatives, their wives or their daughters to be the cashier. And so if uh, in a cash-based business, it is hard for business to grow because you know, of, of the very extensive fraud. But the area that uh, I, I like to focus very much on are the non-government organization because there's a separation of accountability between the donors and the beneficiaries. You see, the donor does not know what the beneficiary gets. And neither does the beneficiary knows what the donor gets. So the NGO is the middleman. And very often, uh, that can be a very profitable, profitable enterprise. I mean, in Nepal, many years back, there was like 38 thousand NGO for a population of 19 million. Can you imagine 38,000 local NGO? And that's, that is uh, before the earthquake. Now I think there's even more. So you can see, you know, there's a huge number of local NGOs. And, and why do we have such a big number of local NGOs? Because it is profitable. It's a very profitable business. So the problem in a cash-based economy is that the receipt are easily fake. You can even have fictitious receipt where the company don't even exist, it don't exist on paper. And I can see here where you have the quantity, but were the quantity actually being received? And then even you have the price. And is this the correct price or is it a fake price? So one of the key problems I realized is that if we cannot depend on receipt, how on earth can I get my accounts audited? See, in Singapore, when my auditor comes in, I got to sign a statement declaring that all my receipts are genuine and correct. You know, I cannot tell my auditor my receipts uh, are, are, can be fake or can be inaccurate because the moment I say that, the auditor will qualify my account. So everybody close one eye and everybody assume that the receipts are genuine because if you say the receipts are fake, then there's no way the auditor can come in and audit the account. So we have a situation which I don't know how that can be resolved because everybody just close one eye because without, without you have to say the receipts are, are authentic to get audited. Because without auditing, without an audit, audit account, you can't get your donations. So everybody has to close one eye. Now, I just want to share some of the work that I've done so that you, you have a, a, a better idea as to my experience. So we have five programs in Cambodia. So you can see that this is an 80,000 square feet children's home in Cambodia where I have 120 children. So I realized that running a children's home is actually like running a hotel. There's infrastructure to be maintained and so forth. And you know, I cook 11,880 meals a month. So it's more like a small restaurant. I will talk more about this later on because one of the key expenses is to buy food. And you know, when we go to the wet market to buy food, there is no receipt. So now how do you ensure 
There is no fraud when you go to the market to buy food and where every day your daily purchase can be three quarters of the staff monthly salary. The temptation to be corrupt is very high when every day you handle cash, three quarters of your monthly salary, and there is no receipt. So I will talk a little bit on this to, to, to show you how we can prevent fraud in such a situation where every day you use cash without receipt. And this is our, uh, our skills training program. Uh, we, we run a skills program for rural youth because many of them uh, cannot speak English, they cannot use computers, they don't have soft skills like decision making, problem solving. So we run this program, a seven months free program, a combination meals, everything is free so that they can get a white collar job. And uh, we have a community program. We build uh, houses, well, and toilets. So you can see this is our, our well. Uh, and we, we do our own thing. We don't contract it out to contractors. We have our own well drilling rig, our own staff. So we don't contract our work out. So how do you ensure there's no fraud? With all this program, every year, I send 400,000 US a year to Cambodia. And I'm not based in Cambodia. I'm not living there. So the, 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 the big question is, how? And, and in a country where fraud is so prevalent, how am I going to ensure that my money is not stolen, where there's no fraud? And, and I have got about 35 staff in Cambodia, and I run uh, four programs. Okay, I run four programs. Okay, I don't know why. Okay, I have four programs. And therefore, what I've developed over the last 20 years are street smart processes. So there are processes that I do not have to rely totally on receipts. So I will just share with you uh, 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 one of the, the some of the, the, the met methodology I use. But the most important thing I realize is we have to ask ourselves, who is responsible for the fraud? Is it the person who took the bribe? Or is it the vendor who sold the food? Or is it the manager in charge of the operations? Or is it the organization who do not have the processes in place? Everyone is responsible, but I think the key is that the organization must have the processes in place. Because if you do not have the processes in place, how on earth is the manager in charge going to ensure that there's no fraud? So it's very important that you must have the SOP, the standard operating processes in place. Because without the processes, there's no way you can uh, detect and prevent fraud. So you must have the processes, train the managers to do it, and then uh, get the staff to do it. We have been operating in Cambodia for almost 20 years, and I, I'm very happy that, well, I cannot say there's no fraud, but I say the degree of fraud is, is very low, all right? Now, I will just use the food cost as a, as a key example, because if you are running a children's home, a hostel, or a meal service program, food is a major cost, and it is, uh, purchases without receipt, without receipt. So you can see this is something uh, very dangerous. And I find that as I travel all over Asia, in many children's homes, I found that only the cook does the buying. Now that is very dangerous. If the same person buys the food day in, day out, without receipt, then the temptation for corruption is very high. And not only that, I've been through so many children's homes and I found, I, can, I say, if you want to know whether a children's home is well managed, you ask one question. And this question is this, can you show me your weighing machine? And I found that none of the children's home I visited has a weighing machine. Then the food is not being weighed. Now that is, uh, uh, diligent, that is negligent. Because if you don't weigh the food, 
how do you know what, how much food you're buying? And the cook can come in and say, uh, okay, I bought 20 kg of chicken. When in fact, he only bought 15 kg. Without weighing, you absolutely have no idea uh, 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 how much uh, food has been bought. So it, it's very easy to, 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 to give a fraudulent receipt, you know, saying that you bought 20 kg of chicken when actually it's only 10 or, or 15. And, and there's no receipt. And there are no details of purchases. So you can imagine, you know, the, the, you are making it so easy for fraud to occur. That's why I'm telling people that, you know, we as an organization, it's our responsibility to make sure that fraud will be detected. If we make it so easy for fraud to be detected, it is our respons responsibility. So in this case, where food is a major cost and there's no receipt and you don't weigh the food and there are no details of purchases, well, I can tell you, you know, fraud is definitely there on a, on a big scale. So the, the question is, is now people say, now Robert, there's no receipt. How do you know? How do you prevent fraud? So I will just share with you uh, uh, our methodology. Okay, now the food handles cash equal to many times his salary with no processors to check his purchases. So principle number one, and this is for not just uh, the food, but many other purchases, never allow one staff to do the buying. But the problem is that only the cook knows what to buy, how much ingredient to buy. So that's why we leave it to the cook because other people, we do not know how much chicken to buy, how much vegetables, you know, we don't know. So in order to, to solve this problem, okay, we must start with something uh, very simple. Uh, okay, now you can see here, uh, uh, after the food is bought from the market, we actually weigh it and then we have an admin staff to record the weighing purchase. So a simple thing as weighing the food is not done. I've not seen a single children's home where they weigh the food. So that, that is a gone case already. If you don't weigh the food, you know, forget about it. You know, corruption will, will exist because you don't even know what you're buying. So in order to, to allow more people to do the buying, we have a menu system. So you can see that with every dish, you know, we have the ingredient that can say the beef, we know the cost for 122 people, the quantity 5 kg, you know, and then we know the total cost. So we know that cauliflower, you know, you, you need to buy 20 kg of cauliflower, 29 kg of spring onions. So with this menu system, we not only know the quantity of food that we need to buy, we also know the cost. So we can see here that the total cost is $43. So it starts with a menu system. So with every menu, you weigh and you determine the amount of ingredient per, per dish. So we have over 60 to 70 dishes for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So before my staff goes to buy breakfast and lunch and dinner, they will say, okay, we are breakfast is dish number 20, lunch is dish 35, dinner is dish 55. And then we will print out this sheet with all the quantity that details the, the amount of ingredient and the cost, and they can go and buy. So in this way, Anybody can buy, not just the cook. So that is very, very important because the more people that is involved in the purchases, the harder is it for fraud to occur. All right. And so you can see here that uh, we, we have the menu for the week, Monday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and we have breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You know? So know that to prevent fraud, for wet food, we don't, it's not just having one or two spreadsheet, but it is a system, a system that helps to detect, uh, prevent and deter fraud. But now many organizations don't have such a system. They just based on the cost per meal per person. So they say, okay, I'll give, tell the code, I'll give you $3 uh, per meal per person. 
So if there are 20 person, I'll give you $60 a day, you know, but what the cook buys, uh, they don't care. So you, you find that, you know, this is a, a very lucrative job for the cook because, you know, they, he will obviously buy the cheapest ingredient. So in this case, they, they are only given the money according to the ingredient that they are buying. And every day, I've been doing this since 2004. Every day when they buy the food, we record it. So you can see here, this is the date, the item amount in English and in Kamaya, the quantity, the actual weight, the total price, the unit price, the price per kilo, the quantity per person, the purchaser, and the weight checker. So we also know who is buying and where they buy it from and who is the one checking the weight. You know, so we, every day we have this detail. And the thing is this, you do not go by the total price because total price has no meaning. If I say I buy $20 of chicken, that is meaningless. It's totally meaningless. What is meaningful is the price per kg. So you say, oh, I'm paying $4 per kg. Ah, then, then you, can, you can say whether the price is reasonable or not. But if I say I buy 20 kg of chicken, well, it depends how, how heavy, how many chicken do you buy? So, it, so you can see that, you know, we need to track by the price per kg, not, not by the total weight. So price per kg is a very important. And once we have this spreadsheet, every six months I will do an analysis and I compare the average price per kg bought by the different groups of people. Okay, by the different group of people. So you can see here, I do a pivot table analysis. I, you can see these are different uh, buyers, Chompa, Kim Hearn, Nguyen San, Li Nu, Mak Chun, Mak Han, Mak No, Sina, Sui Po, Tiara, you know. So I can see that the price per kg and, and uh, I can see there's some variations. So if someone is consistently buying at a higher price per kg, then I will tell that person, okay, now you are not allowed to do marketing anymore. You know, I, I remove you from the marketing. And then with this one, you can see that the prices varies and it should vary. If the prices is always fixed, then I'll be very, very suspicious. Hey, how come your, the price is always fixed? So there must be variation. So you, 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 with the daily record of the wet food, I use pivot table and I calculate the average price per kg for different buyers. So how do you control the wet food process? So the first thing is, you must have a weighing machine. You start with a weighing machine. If you don't weigh the food, then forget it, you're dead already. Then you must record it, uh, the cost, the cost per kg and the quantity in the spreadsheet. And then you must have a menu system to make sure that many people do the buying and not just the cook. You must have a marketing system that determines who's going to buy. And every three to six months, you do a pivot table analysis. And also you need to inspect what is being bought. So being street smart is very important. Uh, once I went and I checked and I found that we bought, uh, I don't know, you know, like, like four chickens, but there were like eight heads and uh, 16 legs. <laughs> you know, four chicken bodies, but there were eight heads and 16 chicken legs. So obviously, they, uh, they put in the legs and the head to build up the weight, you know, uh, without increasing the cost. So of course, uh, uh, I punish the person for doing that because this is being cheating. So you, you got to be also familiar with what you are buying. And then, you know, when you are, you are buying chicken, there's also different kinds of chicken, Thai chicken, uh, Cambodian chicken, you know, chicken with feathers, chicken without feathers, chicken with intestines taken out, chicken without intestines taken out and so forth. So you also need to know uh, what, what food you are buying, all right? Okay, now. So it's, it's very important uh, to, to know the food they're buying. Now this is another example uh, uh, of fraud. Uh, you know, we, we are using uh, gas to cook and when the gas tank is empty, then we call the vendor and we'll give the, the vendor an empty tank and the get vendor will then give us a full tank. So this was my personal experience. When I saw it, I said, 
hold on, hold on, stop it. Let me weigh the empty tank. And I realized that the empty tank was not empty. It was actually one third full. And when I weighed the full tank, it was not a full tank. It was two third full. So we are exchanging a one third full tank with a two third full tank. So we are actually buying one third, not a full tank. So on paper, on the invoice, you are paying the price for one full tank of gas. But the reality is that we are only buying one third. So we are actually paying three times more than we should. So there are many, many ways in which you can be cheated and you cannot just rely on receipts alone to, to determine whether you are being cheated. So what I am advocating is also a methodology, a street smart methodology, you know, that everything you must be on the ground, you must be very street smart, you know, everything you want to check, like the gas tank, you know, you, you must make sure, oh, are we really getting uh, a full gas tank? You know, are we giving him an empty gas tank? So you, you must have a very uh, sharp mind to look at all this. Now, cost is one thing. Now, another thing is, is quality. Are you buying the right thing? Now, we are building a lot of houses in Nepal because of the earthquake. And uh, this comes with uh, this, what we call a corrugated galvanized iron sheet or CGI sheet. And as you can see here, uh, this is the standard in Nepal. If you have a 0.551 millimeter thickness, it is for permanent shelters. If it's not 0.47 mm thickness, it is for shelter where the wind speed is lower than 250 kilometers per hour. And if it's not 0.4 mm, it is for lower wind speed. So for the government, they say that we have to provide not 0.55 mm. Now, if you look at this, not 0.55 mm, you feel minus 0.475, it is less than 0.1 millimeter. So I ask you, how do you know the difference? Because it's only 0.1 millimeter, less than 0.1 millimeter. And very often, they will stamp it as a 26 gauge, but in fact, it is a 28 gauge. So the vendor will cheat you. They will sell you a thinner governor's iron sheet than what you're buying. It's less than 0.1 mm. So many of us will say, well, what to do? There's no way we can check, you know? How to check? Less than 0.1 mm thickness. Our eyes is not so sharp. But lo and behold, if you go to the internet, you find there's something like a digital vernier caliper, which only costs $31, and you can verify the thickness of the CGI sheet. Or if you, if you have a bit more money for 146 Singapore dollars, you can buy a coating thickness meter. So with this, you can actually measure the CGI sheet. So you can see that, you know, the, your, your thinking, your mindset must not be just on accounts, not just on payment voucher, on invoices, on financial transactions. No, you got to go beyond financial transaction to knowing what's happening on the ground and even to be technical. You know, internet is a wonderful uh, 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 medium for you to solve a problem. So it, it took me only 10 minutes before I found this two meter. So for $31, buying a digital caliper, I'm able to ensure that we don't get cheated by buying a lower thickness uh, CGI roof sheet. Now we are also building houses, you know, as you can see, you know, uh, for, <clears throat> for, for, oh, I, 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 I didn't have this. Uh, okay, okay, yeah, I didn't have this. Okay. So even for houses, uh, then a lot of people say, uh, what is the moisture content in the wood? So it's very important to know the moisture content. If there's too much uh, moisture, it's no good. If it's too thin, it's, uh, it's too, too, too low, it's also no good. So again, with a moisture meter that costs just over hundred dollars, we are able to measure the moisture content in the wood just by pressing the two probe into the wood, okay? 
So I see that basically fraud can occur in many, many ways. So the processes, uh, there, there are many different kinds of process uh, that we adopt to detect and prevent fraud. Uh, I've, I've talked about the wet food where we purchase items where there's no receipt. So that's one uh, way. And the other thing is how do you know the right amount is being delivered? Like in the case, the case of the gas tank, how do we know we have delivered the right amount? And then also, are we buying the right materials? Are we paying for the right quality, not the, the, the right thickness of the corrugated uh, iron sheet? <clears throat> and how do you do a proper audit of projects? Uh, apparently, fake projects are also quite common. So in other words, everything is fake. Photographs of beneficiaries, photographs of the project, receipt, the whole project was actually a fake project. So it's very important that you are able to audit the project. Now, for example, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, there was a hurricane in Philippines, the Tacloban, you know, and, uh, uh, and, and, and I met a friend of mine who said that he has built, uh, his organization has built 700 houses for the hurricane, you know, that were damaged by the hurricane. So I asked him, how do you know seven houses have been built? He said, well, I got to trust, you know, you trust and obey, there's no other way. But there is a way. So how can you know whether the houses are being built? It's a very, very simple way. You know what's the way? Use a camera that has GPS coordinate. So any smartphone camera, if you take a picture, it will have the GPS coordinate. So with the GPS coordinate, you know the location of the house. So if you buy, if you build 700 houses, it should come with 700 different GPS coordinates. It is as simple as that. So the sad thing is that people just don't bother. You know, they just don't bother. And the third thing is ensure the service is being delivered. Now I'm seeing vehicles being repaired, but actually no repair was done. Only a repair bill was given to the person, but actually nothing was done, all right? And construction is a very weak link, very weak link. Uh, millions of dollars are being swindled off construction. And because as much as one third of the construction cost is in the foundation, but very often the foundation is not seen or checked. So people only see the walls and the windows, but they don't see the foundation. And, and so that's why for me, uh, when the building is being built, I will go down and see the foundation. I will check the footers. And before they cover it with uh, concrete, I say, don't cover it first. I will go down with a vernier caliper. I will measure all the rebars, that the thickness of rebars, the quantity of rebars is there before they cover it up with uh, concrete. Because once they cover it up with concrete, we have no idea how much iron is inside that, that footer or the horizontal beam or vertical beam. So all the beams and footers, I want to see, I want to see the rebars before it's covered by concrete, you know? And of course, using quality construction materials is very important. Using the right quality of cement, you must use Portland cement, you must use proper bricks, you know, proper uh, 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 <clears throat> paint and so forth. And then, you know, you need to do a proper impact assessment of a project. Is the project really helping the people? How much money? The last one is how much money goes to the beneficiary? And the last one I like to talk about is audited statement. I, I don't understand how an audited statement uh, can be accepted if the receipt can be fake. You know, so, so this, is, this is a very key problem. How do you run it? Uh, 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 how do you audit an account when you know that you cannot trust the receipt? So, okay, thank you very much. You know, I will let, we can have a, a question and uh, I'd like to open to question and uh, answers. <laughs> yeah, a any questions for me? Thank you. I can hear you. Thank yes. you, Robert. I, yeah. I have a question. I mean, uh, usually fraud 
the definition of a fraud, fraud is a deliberate improper action. Yes. So sometimes there is a non-deliberate action and it has to do more of the lack of training or the incompetence of the people doing the work. Yes, yes. How do, you, how do you make sure that this is not the case? Yes. So th that's why, like, in the case of, I mentioned the corrugated galvanized iron, all right? So okay. <clears throat> the staff may not know how to measure the thickness. So you have got to tell them, okay, you get this uh, meter, I'll give you this meter, before you buy, you measure it. So, so yeah, sometimes when the staff do not have the expertise or the training, we have to pro help them with that. Yeah, you, you, you got a good point, you know? Yeah, so sometimes they are, they, are, they are not trained or they are not equipped. So we have to equip them with the tools to do the checking. Okay, now in a similar mindset also, I mean, when you look at why people would, would commit fraud, I mean, sometimes just a matter of opportunity. There is a lax control and they can make money out of it, so they do that. But the other, the other part is also need, need. I'm not yeah. getting paid a livable wage. So guess what? I'm going to compensate by embezzling or, or committing fraud so that, I, so that I could sort of get a better salary. Now, how do you make sure that you're paying those guys a reasonable salaries in the area where they live? So it's a livable salary. Uh, does that make sense? Yes, yes. I, I think, no, no, that, that, that is... Uh... That is a very important thing, you know, because uh, you 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 cannot be in you cannot pay people peanuts, you know, and well, you know, in, in Singapore, our government always have this uh, philosophy: we pay our civil servant an astronomical amount of money, <laughs> hundreds of thousands of dollars per month in salaries, you know, so that they will not be corrupt. So, yes. Uh, so yes, paying them a decent salary, I think that's very important. And also, especially what I, I find is uh, as a foreigner, as a whether you're American or the Singaporean, when we go to a place like Cambodia and Nepal, you know, sometimes we just go for a, a, a lunch, you know, with our local staff and we pay like $30, you know, to us, well, it's not really very much, you know, but that is his two week salary. So when, when the local staff see you spending his two week salary on a lunch, you say, well, you know, this fellow is very rich, you know, I, I better cream some money for myself. So we have to be very careful. So, so that's why uh, I have a policy that uh, when my staff go over, we have a limit on the amount of the, the cost of meals they, they can spend. So we must be very, we must be very frugal, uh, not to show them that we, we spend excessively there, you know, not staying in uh, five-star hotels and all that. We stay in a guest house. <laughs> Sometimes the twenty dollars guest house, so it's very important. You're right. You know, we, we, we have to show the example. Not not trying traveling business class, staying in five star hotel. We all travel in uh, 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 budget airlines. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think the sensitivity also helps. I mean, you don't want to be yeah. a little bit vulgar in the way you act in terms yes, of yes. in terms right. of money. I, I, I yeah. apologize for using the term, but it's 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 really yeah, yeah. correct. It really is. Now, uh, this is very interesting because what you're really doing, uh, Peter Drucker calls it management by walking about. Yes, if you want to yes. do proper management, you really have to walk and see how things are done. And you have done exactly this. You did not stay in Singapore in an air-conditioned uh, uh, office and yes, yes. just sort of did it remotely. You, know, you went there and you actually walked through things. You've seen how they purchased. Uh, you, you, in a, that enables you to put the, lax, the, the strong controls on what, what, what needs to be done. And uh, this is very interesting. I, I, I really thank you. Now, so, I'm yeah, going to pass think, now. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, I, I, think, I think, yes, I think it starts from the top. Where we, we must be willing to make that personal sacrifice. So, for example, a few years ago, I went to audit a construction project in Nepal. And it's right up in the mountain, and I stayed awake in the tent, <laughs> in a one-man tent, you know. Yeah, okay. there's no choice, you know. And I, I realized I'm not very fit, you know, I'm a bit fat. And, and my iPhone showed that I climbed 32,000 <laughs> steps in one day, 32,000 steps. 
for someone that is not fit. Can you imagine that? Up and down the mountain. So you yourself must be willing to make that sacrifice, to be on the field. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm going to pass now the floor to Kariman, and she's going to ask you questions that she got from the floor. Yeah, okay. Kariman, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Robert. That was really insightful. Uh, we have a question here. Uh, as you are aware, there is, there is the fraud triangle, pressure on people, uh, opportunity to commit fraud, and rationalization. You have highlighted the process and controls that ought to be present. But what about the pressure on employees and uh, rationalization um, from those who do the fraud? Um, the culture of the organization and the tool at the top, the penalty mechanism and things like that. Would you please talk a bit about that? Thank you. Yes, I think, uh, okay, when, when I first went to Cambodia 20 years ago, you know, it was, it was a relatively lawless society, you know. I mean, it, I, mean I, I still remember I was so shocked to see that the policemen do not have uniform. They just have a pistol stuck into the belt. So it, it, can you imagine the country cannot afford to give uniform to the policemen? So the whole culture is very difficult. But what I can say is I told my staff within my organization in Cambodia, I do not tolerate fraud. I will pay you reasonably well, you know, and I give you a good job, a long-term job. Many of them have been with me for more than 10 years and they realize that, you know, I think what they appreciate is a long-term job, that to have a salary month after month after month for 10, 20, 15 years, they really can prosper, you know. So within my organization, I ensure there's no fraud. But outside, yes, it's very, very difficult. <laughs> outside my boundary because, yeah, corruption is high. People are so poor. And I really pity them, you know. It, 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 sometimes I, 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 I really can see, you know, when you go and see a doctor in a, in a, in a, private, in a, in a public hospital, you got to pay money. Policeman wants money. Everybody wants money. So it's extremely difficult i can say that very hard you know i i, I can but i i can only solve within my own boundary <laughs> yeah I, I can't solve outside either yeah unless i become a prime minister <laughs> okay any other questions yes we have another question uh, from ghana regarding the construction works do you engage the services of a professional construction firm or a contract to build um, or you just use your staff? I'm asking because uh, of the elaborate checks you said you do to examine the quality of work and cost. No, no. I, 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 I award it to a contractor to build. All right. But again, uh, you must be street smart. I mean, for example, okay. Let's say you're building a building, all right? I know that 30% of the cost lies in the foundation, you know? So when they build the foundation, before they cover the cement, I say, I, I will go down, don't cover the cement, I will go down and look, and I will check, uh, I, I check with my structural engineer drawing. So I turn myself, I'm an electrical engineer. So I turn myself into a structural engineer. I ask my friend, Please teach me how to check buildings. So now I'm quite good at structural engineering. So I go down and check. And then you see, many people only look at the walls, the windows and the roof, you know, but they never check the foundation. But also you need to be street smart because you must know the building cost. And also, you know, in, in I don't know about uh, in Egypt, but in Nepal, Cambodia, they, they always have a bill of quantities, you know. It's a rate-based quotation. So in fact, but when they quote all this, I know, to me, I know, I know a, a, a bag of cement costs how much, a brick costs how much, a river costs how much. So all the material costs, you also must know. So, so when you deal with a contractor, uh, you, you can control him. And because it's rate based, we can check that he's supplying the materials and he's building according to the rate. So for example, I don't give, don't never have a turnkey contract, that means, I give you $3 million to build this building for me. No. Plan is rate-based. 
Okay, every PowerPoint, I give you $15. So if you build 10 PowerPoints, I give you $150. So it's an itemized con con uh, contract, so I can check it. Yeah, so it, it, it must have this methodology. You, you, me and my staff, we must be trained to understand construction. And, and once you know the basic, uh, it's very easy to check. But because people do not know the basic, they, they can get cheated very, very often. Especially like us coming from Singapore, where our construction cost is so high, you know. We, to, to us, it, we get cheated very easily because we are used to very high costs. Yeah, I think you, 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 you got to know what you're doing. And then, uh, uh, you know, so even you don't know, you, you have to teach yourself the need. That's why what, that's what I, I, I realized that, you know, like if I'm doing chicken farming, I got to understand chicken farming. I'm going to read that. I, I study about chicken farming, about feed conversion ratio and all these things. You know, mortality of chicken. Whatever you do, you must, have the expert, you must read up and gain expertise in it. If not, you are just a Santa Claus. <laughs> Any other question? I I think Karimane probably is having a, a connection problem. Oh, okay, okay. She yeah. she sort of uh, disappeared. Uh, yeah. Let me check if she's still still around. I think it's a, there is an. Yeah, I don't think she's she's in. I think she, there is a bad internet connection. But also, I just let me continue. But actually. What I'm think, saying that is, is actually a mindset, it's a methodology, it's a mindset. And I think it has to come from the top. The, 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 the CEO of the charity must be very conscious that he wants to stop and prevent fraud. You know, if, if the, the boss doesn't care about that and only just care about getting good photographs and good reports for marketing, then you will not, you will not, uh, you will not be able to detect fraud. You know, to, to, to me, I started because I was using my own money. <laughs> so if I'm donating my own money, I want to make sure my money is not cheated. I'm not spending other people's money. I'm also spending my own money. So Absolutely. The, the thinking must come from the top. You Absolutely. know, the drive must come from the top. Yes. Okay. Now, Kariman is having some technical problems. I'm going to check with uh, Luciana if she, can, if she has questions. Okay, yes. Lucy, do you have questions from the audience? Yes, I have a few questions. Please yes. go ahead. Okay. Um, first, thank you for the presentation. Um, uh, one question. What do you think about the lines of defense? Um, uh, can, can you hear me? Sorry. Yes, yes, yes. What do you think? What do you think about the lines of defense, like the internal uh, auditor, external auditors, uh, regulators, government in preventing and detecting fraud. And another question is, uh, are loyal employees, uh, who are the ones who stayed longer time in the company, could, uh, and could they do fraud uh, if there is lack of control in place and the owner trusts them? Okay. One of the key problems is, is the fake receipts, okay? So if all auditors will rely on receipts, all right? And actually, uh, uh, it's very hard for an auditor who is just looking at the issue from a purely uh, financial or accounting point of view to detect fraud. He's just looking at receipt and payment, you know, it's very hard to do that. So th this line of control, basing on internal and external auditors, is not easy unless the auditor goes beyond financial receipts. You know, like as, like in the case of my guest example, they go and check. So 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 <clears throat> so it, it it is it's a methodology, and having a loyal staff uh, does help, but sometimes. It's also uh, very difficult. Uh, got in, in, in the early days, you know, in my early days, I had one very good staff. She resigned and then before she resigned, she told me that the reason she re resigned is that she cannot take it. I said, what do you mean you cannot take it? She said, no, people, the other staff are stealing so much, but I cannot tell them. So she doesn't want to be a whistleblower. And, and it, it, so she eats her up 
when she sees all this uh, theft, so she, she resigned. So sometimes it's not easy for a staff to tell on the other staff. And also, what are the processes in place? I think the key thing, as I say, is processes. Let, let me explain to you one, one story, you know. Now, I, you know, we, 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 we have a lot of petrol claims. And you know, the petrol station, they just give you a receipt, written on a piece of paper. So what I did was, I said, look, I want all my vehicles, I've got six vehicles, to do a consumption test. That means I wanted them to, to drive around and tell me one liter of petrol can travel how many kilometers for that particular vehicle. For three months, you know, they did not do this test. I was so angry. They keep saying, busy, busy, busy. So I said, look, if you don't give me this figure, I'm not going to pay you a salary. So finally, they gave me the figure. And you know what happened? Automatically, the next month, without me checking, my total diesel bill dropped by 50%. So the very fact that they know that we are checking was enough to reduce by 50%. But if the staff knows that you're not checking, year in, year out, you never check at all. Well, you know, you're asking for trouble. So with this consumption test, you know, once they know we are checking, wow, straight away it dropped by 50%. So having a loyal staff is good, but again, you're putting too much pressure on the staff. And then also the staff may not be smart enough you know, to, to understand uh, 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 what is going on. So, so sometimes even we have a Singaporean based overseas, but these Singaporeans are not used to a, a country like Nepal or Cambodia. Because in you know, Singapore, we are almost corrupt free. So they, 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 they don't know what to look out for. So again, they must be trained. So you must be trained to know what to look out for. I think that's very important. And then have the SOP in place. Have the SOP, train the SOP, and then make sure everybody follows it. You understand what to do. So that, that's very important. Okay. Oh, thank you. Uh, two more questions. Uh, yes, to, what, to what extent does trust in people working with you influence your work? Do they have the opportunity to undertake self-initiatives in the line of their work? And another one from India, uh, can artificial, uh, artificial intelligence be efficient to tackle fraud? Is fraud used to security purposes and information? Thank you. Yeah, can you make, uh, say the first question again? Uh, to what extent does uh, trust in people working with you influence your work? And do they have the opportunity to undertake self-initiatives in the line of their work? Oh, yes, yes. I, I think... Uh, I, as I said, don't sweat the small stuff. While we have all this checking, you know, it doesn't mean that you restrict the uh, initiative of the staff, you know, and, and you give them, you give them freedom to make this decision, but you have the processes in place. I think this is very important. They can do what they want, but we will have the processes to check them, you know. So, so, in fact, it is actually very good because it keeps them honest. I, I always tell people that, you know, if you tempt people beyond what they can bear, you know, they, they will one day be corrupt. So, so by having the processes in place, you, you keep them honest. And yeah, yeah, and, and, in, and, and that has nothing to do with them having their own ideas and their own creativity they, or the work. They can do the work, but you have processes in place. And artificial intelligence is something, I, I think it's very interesting. I, 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 am, a, I am a very, uh, I love AI, but I think uh -huh. we have to, to reach the stage of, a, of a self loving self-learning AI. Yes, I, I think, when, when uh, AI reaches the stage of, of self-learning, it, it could help because one of the key things in fraud is the detection of patterns, is the detection of patterns. So AI is something that can really help us to detect the patterns, you know? Yeah, so, so certainly, yes, uh, 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 it certainly would, would help us in, in, uh, in many ways, especially when you have a very big project and you have so many things to look at. So AI would help you to, 
detect patterns, do comparison, do analysis, you know. Yeah, certainly, yes. That, that's, that's a very interesting uh, idea. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ali. The uh, floor is yours. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Robert, I uh, really thank you for... Uh, it's completely different than whatever we had before. This is really now <laughs> field work, really hands-on, and really talking about, like... Uh, it's just very practical, very, very field work kind of an experience. And I, I, I see, I appreciate what you're doing. I mean, being keen that the money you're delivering really reaches and it, it, it gives an impact is very unusual. So I, I thank you for your uh, participation and I thank you for the knowledge you, you brought to us. Yo, thank you for letting me share. Yes, thank you, Ali. <laughs> thank you, I'm very glad to share, share, share what I have with all of you. Yes. Thank you. We're still going to take you on on the, uh, you said you're going to give, give training to some people about uh, financial controls and fraud deduction. If you can do like more like a small kind of a workshop, but we'll talk about this offline. But I, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, I'm can, more yes, interested yes, in getting your experience more <laughs> uh, uh, spread over. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I'm. I think yeah. Especially in your area, uh, you know, which is in the African continent, I think there's a great need for this. You know, because Af Africa is is a is a very poor continent, and and I always feel that uh, uh, that that's one area I I would really like to help as well. You know. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, Thank you, sir. Yeah. Again. Don't worry, you know, let's see what we can do. <laughs> sure thing. I'm sure there are more things we can do. Uh, yeah. Next week is loaded with webinars. We have three. Oh, uh, good. On Monday, we're going to have Phil Buchanan. Phil Buchanan is the president of the Center of Effective Philanthropy. He's going to talk about philanthropy in, in a crisis. Truth is revealed. This is on Monday. The TEP is, is a very interesting uh, consulting firm. I, I would suggest you search, look, look for Center for Effective Philanthropy. Phil Buchanan has a book about giving done right, which is more about how to ensure the impact of the money you give. And I think it fits nicely with what Robert talked about today. But he's going to talk about it more from a higher level point of view. On Tuesday, we have Susanna Puerto and Jonas Bosch from ILO, and they're going to talk about the Global Initiative on Decent Jobs for Youth. This is a, pro, a program project that ended and they are launching a report and they're using our webinar series as a launching, uh, one of the launching pads. On Wednesday, we're going to have a very interesting uh, speaker, uh, Paul Mason. He's, he's from the Open Government Partnership. He's going to talk about promoting accountable, responsive and inclusive governance. So he's going to talk about governance. We've talked about governance, governance, governance. So we will have a session next Wednesday where we talk about what exactly is this. Again, I thank you for your participation. Stay tuned. See you soon. And thank you, Robert, again for your contribution. Okay, with my us. pleasure. Yes. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Bye bye, you all. Yeah. Bye bye.